Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Heather Denniston, and this is the Junk You Should Know show that airs every Friday at noon PST. And you guys know I just got back from Spain, and this is my first interview since coming back, and I could not be more tickled to be welcoming Jeanette Bronet to the show. She is a fantastic uh, resource, wealth of information, and you are going to want to just sit down with your cup of tea and hang out with us for the next 20 or 30 minutes because she's amazing. So welcome, <laughs> Jeanette. I, I appreciate you. you being here. Yes. Um, I first discovered Jeanette on, uh, well, on Facebook and in a, in a public speaking group we're both a part of, and I just was wowed by what she's putting out into the world and the changes that she's <laughs> making in industry and in women's lives and uh, all sorts of things. We're going to get into that. So we've titled our talk today, Mind Shifts, Relationships and Practical Practices, and we're going to get into that. Uh, but I want to tell you just a little bit about Jeanette uh, before we get going. And she is an executive and C-suite coach, She's, which is like, she is what I want to be when I grow up. Like she is just <laughs> doing it. I just love it. She's a performance and has a program called Path for Life that we are going to touch on here shortly and a book called Eat to Fill Full, um, which we're also going to talk about. There's just so much content here. You guys are going to love it. So, so uh, will you tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you to doing all these incredible things? I sure will. And thank you. Um, I, I, you know, I grew up in the fashion business. I grew up in Denmark, number one. And uh, so even though my name is French, my ancestors were French, but I'm actually Danish. And so I tend to say that I'm born and bred, which is kind of a pun because we eat so much bread in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I, I grew up in Denmark I, and I got my first sort of education in Denmark in marketing and in fashion. And when I came to the States, I continued within the design world and the fashion world. And by the time I was 40, I had burned out twice um, and I got the message from the doctors that it was only a matter of time before I would get cancer because mm. both my parents had recently died, both of them from cancer a year apart. Mm. And so I really had to do a hard stop, like, you know, really relook and rethink not only how do I live my life, but also how do I work mm -hmm. and what am I really passionate about? And I started asking myself some, some of those questions like, well, what do I <laughs> kind of like, the, the opposite version of what do I want to be when I grow up? Uh -huh. It was more like, it was more like if I look back um, at the end of my life, what would I have been proud of doing? Mm -hmm. Or and what is something that I would still love to be engaged in when I'm older? And I, I sort of asked these questions that was much further down the, the road. And I realized that one of the things that was really important for me, especially with that sort of verdict hanging over my head, was to really find a way that we could work better be healthy and happy. It sounds pretty sort of, oh, well, yeah, sure. And I think there's so much to it mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it is really our happiness that affects us so much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in like that emotional wellness. Yes. And so what happened was when I started coaching people and, and working with people, because I was all gung-ho, I'm just going to tell people how to take charge of their health and be healthy. And I realized it's not that simple, not only because of habits that – we're sort of like continuing the old habits and things like that, but also because our emotional landscape is such a big part of how we make choices every day. Mm -hmm. And so that's okay. when I realized that it's really based in nourishment. Like how mm -hmm. do we find a way to feel nourished? And that has been the core of my work for all these years. And, and uh, we're not talking just food. We're talking life nourishment and all kinds of that, yeah. that we can just go deeper and deeper and deeper into what nourishment means and I love yeah. that idea because I think we can get stuck on the surface saying I've got to work out I've got to eat better but there's so much more to it yeah. and that that's why I love the work you're doing because anytime I've heard you speak I'm like yes you're getting down below what everyone's trying to hard sell up top and going no 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 no, no. that's important yeah. yeah but what's more important is down yeah. here yeah and so yeah. I think that's super super powerful so um I stalked your LinkedIn before we got on here and you have a quote on there that I also have used and it's by Richard Branson and it says clients do not come first employees come first if you mm -hmm. take care of your employees they will take care of the clients it, it, it's um, it, it's a it's a not I don't want to say simplistic in the bad sense of the word but it's it is 
a, a simple way of saying, no matter what you do, if you don't take care of the health of your employees, right. you, you will not be as successful as you hope and, and want to be. Right. And, um, and so you do do a lot of uh, work in the workplace, but you also have this online program that us lay folks who um, aren't going to get the chance to hear you and see you in the workplace or be coached independently by you in the workplace, we have another avenue to get to you. So let's just talk a little bit about this Path for Life program, because I think it dovetails off that whole idea of nourishment yes so it does. yeah so can you tell me a little bit about that program sure what I, what I realized when I started working with people is that all change is a process and since part of what I had studied um, throughout these years of my own personal uh, growth and development was mindfulness mm. um, and I was really fascinated by this idea of getting to know ourselves better I think I've been fascinated by that idea since I was a little kid, actually. Mm. I always was wondering, how do we know ourselves better? Uh, maybe because I was an only child, maybe because I was a, a daughter of uh, a mother that struggled with depression. And so this self-relationship idea was really, really important to me. And so when I was working with clients, I realized that the process of change had to do with knowing more. Mm -hmm. So the program has a food knowledge um, aspect to it but from the perspective of Chinese medicine which means mm -hmm. when we know how food affects us mm -hmm. we're educated eaters mm -hmm. instead of just being like is that healthy is that not healthy why was yeah. it but it's more like learning how food affects us because now we can we can actually modify or, or, or we can personalize the way we eat yeah. based on knowing ourselves more and I love eating intelligently and consciously. Yeah. And it's funny, I'll sit down with people and they're like, oh, you're not allowed to have that, right? Or that's bad for you, right? And and those two concepts need to be just moved out of the way and yeah. so that people can make informed choices like you're talking about, understanding how food affects their body, yeah. what is happening when you are digesting and absorbing these particular nutrients, yeah. and it becomes conscious on a whole other level and fa uh, food fails to be bad or good, allowed or not allowed, yeah. you make choice. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I love that. So continue on, tell me a little bit more yeah. about the program because I know there's nine steps to it, so I know, right. uh, yeah. Yeah, so I go through each nine step has the food knowledge, the mindfulness, and how do we habit change? Like, how do we change our habits? So each of the nine steps have that aspect to it. So it's a very integrative approach in each step. And each step, dig, uh, each step digs deeper and deeper into the food groups mm -hmm. and how it affects our body and our health and healing. Yeah. Our mindfulness, how do we get more and more aware? How do we yeah. get more and more into a better relationship and, 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 and knowing ourselves more? Like, what is that process like? Yeah. So I talk about moving from the inner critic to the inner coach. I talk mm -hmm. about uh, it's not about willpower. It's about love power. So there's all yeah. of these different things that opens up and shifts our relationship with ourselves. Because if mm. we don't change our relationship with ourselves, we're not getting to the final piece, which is how do we actually change our habits? We don't change yeah. our habits because we have to. We change our habits because we want to. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That is so awesome. Now, you, um, when you and I talked before about you coming on the show, we talked a little bit about how your personal self-care changed after turning 50 and yes. that there were some shifts that you made. And I know a lot of my audience is women over 40, women over 50. So can you share um, your, your sort of take on that? Yeah. You know, I, I actually love this idea of of rethinking that relationship that we have with ourselves over our process of life. Mm. Because if you really think about it, we have that happen to us a couple of times in our lives. Right. And I think mm -hmm. the first big change is puberty. Mm -hmm. Right. And then like 30s and 40s, some people, when they have kids, like they're changing their relationship with their body in that process. Mm -hmm. But the next big change happens in menopause. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of call menopause the adult puberty. Uh, yeah, I love that. Right, right? because it, where hormones are going a little bit like, wait, what's going on? And the other thing is, is that it, the hormone changes changes our bodies. Mm -hmm. And it does so in puberty as well. And we're, we're sort of like trying to figure out what is this new body like? Yeah. And I think with puberty, we expect that because we're growing, yeah. we're becoming women. But then in our 50s, when we go into menopause, it's like, wait a minute. Can I yeah. stay the way I looked like when yeah. I was 25 or whatever? <laughs> like, no, actually, you can't. Um, yeah. And it's this idea of coming into right relationship with that. 
Um, so that's one thing. And also what I found was that I, um, I didn't have hot flashes because I cut out dairy a very mm -hmm. long time ago because of my high risk breast cancer. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, scientifically proven. There's a mm -hmm. lot of indication that that is. Yeah has something to do with it. In Chinese medicine, we look at it in that direction. Chinese medicine and functional medicine is very closely related, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. Um, but the other side of it was, I noticed, mm -hmm. right? So, and I see it with, with women, for example, and, and that struggle a lot with heart flashes. A lot of them are high animal food eaters, mm -hmm. especially dairy. So mm -hmm. that was one thing I was like very aware of that. So I didn't really struggle much with heart flashes, yeah. but I had migraines. Uh. And so I was like, what's happening with my migraines, right? And it's this idea that our that our um, estrogen drops and, you know, mm -hmm. we get migraines and so on. So I learned how to notice. So I still was, was calculating everything. And I started seeing how a couple of days before my period, I would get a migraine for three days. Mm -hmm. But I could change what I was eating and my migraines then started. I started being in charge of my migraines. Yeah. Instead so, of them in charge of you. Yeah. And so it was this listening to my body and really asking questions. And I think that's what we can learn from these processes of change, especially mm -hmm. when change happens to us, like menopause and hormonal changes and things like that. This idea that we ask our bodies to guide us mm -hmm. rather than being upset. Yeah. I, I love right? that. We and tend to be upset. Yeah, we do. And, and I think that upset is further exacerbating issues, right? That stress, yeah. those, that hormone dump, all of that is going to yeah. exacerbate some of those things. You said something a couple minutes ago, somewhere along the lines of um, getting in right relationship. Can you just talk about that a little more? Because I think that's a very powerful point to not just gloss over. So yeah. can you just share a little bit more about what that means, getting in right relationship? Yeah. Um, it's something that comes from the Buddhist practice, actually. I studied, I started studying Buddhism and mindfulness when I first came to this country at 26 in mm -hmm. 1989. I've been here 30 years this year. Oh, Sounds strange. Yeah. 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 So, um, but this idea of coming into right speech, right relationship, and so on and so forth. So right relationship, I think, is this idea that we're looking with compassion. Mm -hmm. We're listening. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are looking at how can I help? Mm. Right. So if it's with our bodies, for example, I, we can ask our bodies. So how can I help you? Like, what can I do mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. helps my body do what it does best? And if mm -hmm. we come into right relationship, we can listen rather than mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. Right. We can wonder rather than um, rather than judge. Oh, I love that piece. That wonder rather than judge is huge. Keep going. Yeah. And it's this idea that instead of criticizing ourselves for not being what are, are skinny yeah. enough or, you know, we're too hungry all the time, whatever yeah. it is we're criticizing ourselves for, instead, we can ask, what do I need so that I can? Yeah. And it's this idea of asking, how can we move forward? Mm -hmm. Like, get it? When I say we have to shift from being if to how, mm. right? So if we start looking at how can I help, mm -hmm. how can I best do this how do i what do i need so i can feel better today and start mm -hmm. learning how to listen for that because we actually get the answers from our bodies it's not like our mm -hmm. body's sitting there going well let me text you back but it's this yeah. idea right but it's this idea that our bodies start responding because we're listening mm -hmm. right? yes and it's not like yeah. a chatter the way our brain chatter is but it's these small things where we actually already know this mm -hmm. but we've just completely suppressed yeah. This relationship we have with our bodies where we're actually a team. Let's face it. Yeah. We're stuck together for forever. Yeah. Well, at least, you know, yes. <laughs> for the end of this lifetime, right? Like yeah. this is the one relationship that we will have our entire freaking life. Yes. And yeah. it's the most difficult one we have. Yeah. Amen. With our very self and our very own body. Mm -hmm. So how can we come into this right relationship that says, hey, look, you and I, we're it. Mm -hmm. We got to figure this out. Yeah. How do we figure it out? I love that so much. And the, the idea that I think if we stop listening, our body turns down the signals. And as you start listening and practice listening, those signals turn up 
a little bit again. And so then you become more and more and more in tune and intuitive right. to what your body needs and wants. Right. And um, so that is, I think that is just such a cornerstone of any wellness shifts that you're making is that listening and and yeah. the um, the curiosity versus the attacking. That's right. very big, especially yeah. for those in chronic pain of any kind or who are um, you know really suffering a lot of menopausal symptoms and just getting so mad about it. Um, yeah. Instead, asking why, what yeah. what's happening here? Why what, yeah. what why are we going through? You know, I think that's very very key. Yeah. Um, and also, what I did was I started experimenting because actually, I I actually think that our bodies are sing, sending us signals. I actually think we're just ignoring them. Yeah. So, for example, you know, gas and bloating that's a signal. Yes. But we're just like, oh yeah, I'm gassing and bloated, but I'm not actually going to ask why that is. Yeah. We're just assuming that there's something wrong with us. I was like, no, actually your body's just trying to talk to you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's really like, good. Yeah, you know, it's just trying to tell you that it's not digesting the food you're giving it. Yeah, it's me as a chiropractor with 22 years of practice, patient after patient would come in saying, well, I've got blank, but it's just normal blank. I've got headaches, right. it's just normal headaches. No, none of that stuff is normal. It's common, that's different. Yeah. Normal, yeah. no, and so retraining ourselves to go. Oh no, your body's giving you signals for a reason, yeah. and uh, and we don't need to suppress them. We need to listen to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's huge. Yeah. What and this this idea of constantly con asking ourselves, right? Like, mm -hmm. what's going on in there? How am yeah. I right now? What do I need? And especially, I think in menopause, I think those are the, some of those questions that we need because we are relearning a new relationship with our bodies in menopause and as we yeah. age. And yeah. it can be a really beautiful relationship. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things I learned is I need to stretch and use my body every day because I get yeah. sore and tight if I don't. Yes. I didn't used to. Am I going to yeah. get upset with my body for that? Or am I just going to be like, yeah, of course, this is what you yeah. need. Yeah, good. I, I think that's so great. So what are three things uh, that you think we women are maybe making, I don't want to say mistakes, but that we're maybe just in the wrong direction in regard to our wellness and health. I think the big thing is that because we gain weight after menopause normally, like that's a very normal thing to do. I gained my menopause weight too. Like I gained like five pounds and then eight pounds. And I was like, all right, there they are, those yeah. menopause pounds. And then I realized, well, let me start playing with it. Instead of trying to lose the pounds, yeah. let me try to wonder where they're coming from. And so mm. I started playing with my food and I changed certain things. And one of the things I realized that was that if I restrict on starch, which normally is how people go immediately into, oh my God, I'm gaining weight. I better not have, enough, have starch. If I don't have starch, I mm -hmm. feel imbalanced. And I started gaining weight because I tried to look at oh, what is the way I'm supposed to be eating if uh -huh. I want to control my weight as I age? But that huh. wasn't what worked for me. I see. So you kept I trying needed to my things. brown rice. I needed all of those things because mm -hmm. if not, I wasn't feeling in balance with myself. I wasn't mm -hmm. feeling that sense of, of not only nourishment, but also that sense of, oh, my body is good right now. Like I'm yeah. feeling like I'm right there. I have the energy, I have the focus, I feel calm, I feel centered, I feel I belong in my own body. That feeling, yeah. if I ate the way you would eat on a diet, mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel that way. Yeah, I think that brings up a good point. And that is, uh, I think everyone should just remember that all of those things out there, paleo, keto, veganism, whatever, they're guidelines and that we are all individuals yeah. and we need to listen to how our body is responding yeah. And, yeah. and make those shifts according yeah. to, you know, your master controller. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's great. What else? So that was one thing. So really like not looking at it as a diet, but again, looking at it as how do I feel nourished? Because when yeah. I feel nourished, I'm going to skip all the snacking. I'm going to get, skip all the roaming around for, yeah. for all these things that are normally what gets us in trouble more so than real food. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest here, right? Totally. The other thing is that I realized that my body couldn't metabolize alcohol the same way. So I really mm -hmm. had to change. I love a good glass of wine. Like I, that's yeah. my, that's a ritual. It's something I learned from when I was a young kid. It was part of my mm -hmm. family way of having a beautiful dinner on a, on a Saturday night. And so for me, and it's still for me today, like sometimes like, oh no, actually maybe just one glass of wine and I can't have any more because I don't metabolize alcohol as well. Yes. And so the, the fragility in a sense 
mm -hmm. of my detoxification system. I've had oh, to learn cool. how to really look at how that has changed. The fragility of your detoxification system. I love that. Yeah. That's that is so helpful. Yeah, it uh, needs a lot and, more support now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and it's tied into the metabolism, right? So the more I learned how to like hold back on certain things, mm -hmm. like alcohol um, and, and other things that I could tell was causing me to just feel sluggish. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, it's not because I want to lose weight. It's because my body is not dealing very well with like bread and wheat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that I would like, I would gain weight immediately. So it wasn't real weight, but it was yeah. this kind of like just heaviness and, and sluggishness. And I was like, let me, let me deal you know, have fun with this. So it wasn't like I was carb restricting. It was just that particular thing. Yes. Was different. And I, yeah. and I realized I got so much more moody when I ate it. I got mm -hmm. more moody when I was drinking wine. So I got more moody from all of those things. And I was like, Oh, mm -hmm. but if I don't want to be moody, maybe it's not a big deal to not eat that. And I'll yes. do brown rice or oatmeal or whatever else I would do. Or, you yeah. know, so it's not the starch that I'm, but it might be that one thing that's not working yeah. for me. Yeah. And and so that was also really listening to like, how do I feel the next day? Right. And so that, that was okay. because that was me understanding how does my body keep up with the detoxification and the recovery overnight? And so when I was feeling sluggish the next morning, there was a good chance I needed to look at what was I eating last night. Yeah, that's great. And that's a good reminder for folks who are new to the idea of your body being a little sensitive to foods. It's not an immediate reaction in most cases. Yeah. It's the next day or the next yeah. night. Uh, yeah. For me, sometimes it's a couple of days. And yeah. so uh, that's testament to how it take, how long it takes your body to really process through things yeah. and um, for that reaction to happen. And sometimes it's a cumulative thing too. So um, that's, that is some good yeah. information and in that you've, you just listened, you knew which type of Thing it was and it wasn't oh I'm gonna eliminate all carbs then it right. was okay yeah. I see that this and this affect yeah. me yeah. and it, it, com it comes back to that listening if you weren't listening you wouldn't have identified that right yeah yeah and the other Good. thing I also realized was I am in a lot more in need of downtime and, uh, and really and, and downtime for me is a break and a pause where I just go for a walk in the middle of the day it may be that I sit with a cup of tea instead of taking it with me it may it, yeah. it is that I need my sleep I need to be really serious about my sleep and so mm -hmm. all of those things is because my nervous system and and the 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 effect of stress would be more mm -hmm. overwhelming and I really yes. need it to have have that switch between right now I'm active right now I'm just yeah. taking a break. Oh, I agree. I like that a lot. All three of those things that you mentioned, I'm just like, yes, I totally resonate with that. I'm sure a lot of folks who are watching yeah. do as well. And for those guys that are tuning in right now live, uh, thank you so much for joining us live. I appreciate it. Good to see you, Terry. Good to see you, Jennifer. And um, those watching in replay, I love you just as much. And so uh, food stories, you yes. talk about that. Uh, what does that mean? I love my food stories. <laughs> awesome. My favorite story is when um, I had my office on 11th and Broadway for many years. And all of a sudden, like, you know, halfway into my life there, I was there for like, I don't know, 14 years or something. But halfway in, they put a pain quotidienne, which has this amazing fruit tart that I used to love back from back home, right? And so I would walk by this window with a fruit tart sitting there staring at me at least twice a day, if not three to four times a day, right? And so I was like, I had to come into right relationship with that fruit tart. Yes, that's, it, right? that's hilarious. Because that fruit tart had its power over me, at least mm -hmm. at the time, right? And so I would go in and I would set up with my fruit tart, my cup of tea, and I would sit there and have my fruit tart and I would be like, it's not really working. It's like not oh, yeah. making me feel the way I wanted it to make me feel. And I realized that it wasn't about the fruit tart. It was about the fact that I was missing my mom because her and I would mm. used to take afternoons where we would go to the go to the go, go to the city, and then one of the things we would do would have tea and fruit tart. Oh. So I could never find a fruit tart anywhere to replace that experience. Oh, that's good. Right. So that's a food story. Mm -hmm. And so if we can learn about these food stories, food no longer has that hold over us. The cravings yeah. don't have the hold. So now when I see a fruit tart, I smile and I think of my mom. Oh. And then if I want a fruit tart, fine.
but then it's because I want that fruit tart. Yeah. Not because I want what the memory of it is. I think that is uh, just with you talking, it made me think about um, junk food, like a candy for me yeah. is, yeah. is a weakness. And I'm like, yeah. oh, what? So if I follow your kind of trail on that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was left alone a lot as a kid. I used it as a comfort system yeah. um, and it, it satiated me, it sedated me um, so that my stress would go down temporarily yeah. um but that's but that would be definitely my food story around yeah. candy yeah. and so then it's great because then we provide ourselves the opportunity to go and work on that yeah and that's now we powerful. can find an alternative because yeah. now you know what it is see the food story is a feeling you're trying to recreate yeah oh I really, and so if you know like that that, that is so a lot of what i do is i work with what's called the felt sense right okay. and that's what nourishment is about too it's like how do we want to feel mm -hmm. Most of the time we want to fix not feeling good by just numbing it or getting rid of it instead yeah. of saying, okay, so what do I want to feel instead? Yeah. Right. So like, for example, if we're tired, we want to fix tired and we normally do that by stimulating foods instead of yeah. saying, well, actually what's the opposite of tired? The opposite of tired is having more energy. Yeah. So if we want to ask, how do I get more energy? That's true energy. Like, sustainable energy, things that are actually going to get me through the day rather than just yes. fix tired right now with a cup of coffee and some sugar. If yeah. I need real energy, what does that look like? And there's a good chance that that looks like a proper meal. I got something. Yeah. In my head, sorry. Really there's a good chance that that looks like a good meal and a healthier yeah. one because that's where the energy comes from. And so it's this idea that if we follow what I call the red thread back to the food story, we can come into right relationship with that food story, come into right relationship with that craving and come into right relationship with what our bodies really need in that moment ah. so that we can achieve the feeling that we really want to feel. And for you, that is, I want to feel more relaxed and not so overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. What is another way I could do that? Well, maybe I just need to go for a walk and have a cup of tea. Yeah, exactly. And it, it actually is, it's emotionally freeing um, yes. because then you, you break the bonds and yes. Uh, or the bondage, and uh, and and so uh, that's a that's such a great tool, and I love that you shared that with the audience today because I know there's lots of folks out there who are going to be able to use this and start to ask those questions of themselves. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, you have a book, yes, and it is uh, Eat to Feel Full, and I want to just put it up here on our screen so people can go and order it. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about one of the things, um, I'm an author, you're an author. When I started writing my book, uh, I had somebody very powerful speak into my life and say, um, why, what do you feel like you have to say about this? That's, yes. that's unique and different. And um, because there's a million books on different food programs, resets, yeah. all sorts of different things. So can you tell us what your unique voice was for this book? Yeah. I tend to do something when I get pissed off. <laughs> Write a book. <laughs> so one of them was, you know, the book. I got so upset about all the dieting mentality. And because I saw how it was really destroying people's lives and it, yeah. not people's lives as a, you know, but people's no, relationship with food, which is not a big yeah. part of our lives and their relationship with themselves, this dieting mentality was really destroying our relationship with ourselves and our very own body. And I found it not only sad, but also upsetting. And yeah. so, and, and what I consistently saw when I was working with clients over all these years, and I've had thousands of clients work with me through this, and they consistently find that if they eat to feel full, they lose weight. Mm. Interesting. Right. And so it's this idea that we think we have to 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 starve ourselves to lose weight. We think mm -hmm. we have to eat less. We mm -hmm. eat a salad. Like if you gave me a salad for lunch and nothing else, I would probably gain weight. You know why? Because I would be roaming through anything and everywhere yeah. where I could find snacks afterwards. Yeah. And I wouldn't exactly. be able to control myself because mm -hmm. my hormones would kick in and be like, you're on survival mode, girlfriend. Yeah. We're not getting enough food and energy here. Yes. You need to find food wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And so our old survival mode sets in. And we're living in a world where we like see food, want food kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? We yeah. see food. And the second we see it, we kick into the same old hormones that will pick it up yeah. and eat it. 
And yeah. these days, it's not berries and nuts and whatever that we find on the trees and far in between. These days, yeah. it's M and M's and chips and candy and whatever it is on every street yeah. corner. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And so it's this uh, this idea that our bodies are still the same old bodies they were thousands of years ago, right? Yeah. And if we yeah. can understand how our bodies truly function, and then take good care of them from the perspective, of, you need to come out of survival mode. You need food. You need water, you need to feel safe, you need sleep, and so, and shelter, you know, all those things. And we need emotional safety as well, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times when we don't eat enough mm -hmm. and we start feeling like, you know, there's also a, there's some kind of vibrational nervous energy that happens in our bodies, mm -hmm. at least for most people, right? Mm -hmm. If we're hungry, we also don't feel safe. There's a weird combination between those two physical feelings and the emotional sort of way we feel. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing when you go to the office every day and you don't know who's going to yell at you. Mm -hmm. What happens to people at the offices? They snack all day long to calm themselves down mm -hmm. because they're not feeling safe at work. It's very, right? very big. Yeah. Now, so a lot of these things that I've seen are very just normal human behaviors. If you overlay that on a culture and the mm -hmm. way we engage with each other and the relationship we have with ourselves, how we overlay that with the relationship we have with other people. Now you start understanding why we have so many toxic cultures and burnout cultures. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I agree. That's the, that's the piece where I'm looking at it and saying, wow, the way we have a relationship with ourselves really actually becomes the relationship we have with everything and everyone else. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And I think when we neglect that, it's just so reflected in everything that's going on around us yeah. that's related yeah. to us. Yeah. Oh, and that's so why good. I wanted to write the book. I want it to, I want it to break up with our dieting mentality. Yeah, and I, I love that idea. So in the book, is there, um, are there specific like food plans or is it more of a kind of like, here's how we connect with uh, yeah, how it's we're more supposed to eat? Yeah, I don't give people food plans. I give them outlines. Good. And I, I tell them what to listen for and what to look for. Yeah. Because now I want to educate people so they can eat. I don't want to give them a food plan so that they can be right. Yeah. Because that's not working. If it worked, it would have worked by now because yeah. we've had diets for a very long time and they're and, all based on food plans. Yeah, exactly. I'm in right? total agreement with you. I love that that's yeah. kind of how you are teaching. And I, you, when we were talking just before we came on, we were talking about your speaking schedule, which is crazy yeah. and uh, very full. And I said, well, so are you speaking more or coaching more? And I loved what you said about that, that um, you consider speaking coaching from the stage. Yes. And, um, and so I, I love that you are always in that mode. You're always uh, trained and tuned into how can I impact someone's um, wellness someone's health by yeah. what I'm saying and what I'm what I'm teaching so I, I really appreciate that you're putting that out there it's really great mm -hmm. so before we wind down can you tell well first of all I want to mention something you have been super super kind to offer uh, the audience a discount on your path for life program I think we said it's typically 190 you're offering it for 135 or 137 yeah. and uh, that's a huge discount and you guys this is an, a major value I, I've I've scrolled through the whole looked at every single of the nine steps and the picture and everything that goes with it and reviews and it's it looks like a very very powerful program I'm actually very excited to um, follow up with that so thank you for sharing that with us and I know uh, lots of our audience will be interested in checking that out so the website is listed on the scroller thing crawler thing on the bottom I'll also put it in the comments yeah. but before we wind down tell me what you think like one if if I always love asking my guests this because you know your stuff better than I do. And so what is maybe one thing that I haven't asked you that you're like, no, you should have asked me this. Mm. <laughs> can, can you can you share what would be one final thing that would be a good takeaway point for our audience? I think it's the, um, the reason why this feels so important to me is because um, I saw my mother every day struggle with her relationship with herself. Mm -hmm. And it cost her, her probably her health as well, but also her joy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, I don't think it's fair that this relationship we have with ourselves should be one that we struggle with. Mm -hmm. 
and that our culture actually exasperates that mm -hmm. and our work culture pushes us to our edges instead of supporting us to actually finding a way that we can be at our best every single day i think we deserve to be at our best every single day yeah and 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 i think if we can ask more like what do i need today so that i can be at my best it's such a small question with a huge impact and if that's one thing that people can can do every day they're already starting on a big step of change yeah i i that is a powerful uh thing to close the show with i i just and i think we um we have to keep coming back to it because culture pulls us away from taking that time we need and self-reflection and all that we have to constantly keep coming back to center and going, am I, am I listening enough? Am I taking enough time? Am you know, am I, am I, you know, spending enough time with my mind and my body to really know what it's needing and what's going on. So yeah. um, great tip on that. Well, thank you so much. I wish you all the success uh, going thank forward. You. I know you've got a lot of speaking gigs coming up and a lot of coaching and uh, different things that you're doing. So I know everybody's super grateful that you took the time out for us today and thank you. Um, you're welcome. So guys, we'll see you next Friday. Remember the show always lives on YouTube forever. It'll be here as long as you want to scroll down and see it. But if you want a quick uh, link to it, just head over to the well fit and fed YouTube page and you can check it out there. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys all next week at noon PST for the next junk you should know show. So goodbye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye.